guys, you guys come in. Let me know who's here. I'm uh, actually playing. I literally just had uh, uh, the uh, mailman drop off a, a pedal. I, I just stuck it on my pedal board and I'm going, hey. Let's play with the clon. <laughs> so, as you come in, say who you are, where you're at. So far, I like it. I might have got this thing at a... Uh... M drive, which is my usual transparent boost. And then here's the uh, the uh, J Rocket Archer. Oops, could be a little bit louder. Oops. Make sure I got the right one. Let me just put everything uh, straight up. The J Rocket Archer pedal, so it's like their clon. It's the the gold one, so it's like the icon. I don't really know what that means in human speak. So here's everything like straight up. Um, I had a Soul Food. I've never really had any other clon pedal before. this better than the other ones. Thanks, Jeremy. So here's clean. M drive. Horsey pedal. Let's put the gain all the way up and see what happens. It's probably going to suck. I'm just not a big fan of clowns being that, that, uh... That's kind of cool, though. We'll mess with it. Just occasionally on recordings, I'm like, hey, you know what? Having that clown thing is really nice. So yeah, I finally got a horsey pedal on here. There's the horsey. So, um, you guys will have to give me some feedback. I've got, this is my new computer. Um, so if I'm like fumbling with stuff, it's not because the computer doesn't work. It's because literally, um, I'm st like, I've had it 24 hours. I'm still setting things up. Um, what's interesting is that, um, I'm using the onboard webcam. This is the one on the right. Uh, the one on the right is my nice camera I do the videos with, and the one on the left is the webcam that uh, comes with the computer, which compared to my old Apple webcam. So we may not bother with that one much anymore. So, okay, so let's talk about, um, yeah, I'm actually using my regular microphone for, uh, I'll give you guys a little tour. Um, whoops. I hope I actually. So there's there's the computer, iPad. There's the microphone I'm using. That's the camera I'm actually not using anymore. Hey Tom. And this is the webcam I was using uh, for a lot of stuff before. This is my my old lesson webcam. That's now. Uh... So okay. Anyway, enough of that. Whoops. Um, all right, so uh, let me have a quick question for you guys. Um, how many of you guys actually um, 
watched and um, cared about this week's lesson. <laughs> also, if I look very swollen right here, it's because I have this major like dental issue going on. And I'm finally on enough um, anti-inflammatories to not be in total pain. So, But yeah, I look like chipmunk on one side because it's like all in need of the dentist, which I'm going on Friday. Cool, thank you. Um, so anyway, so I guess let me start off with um, this week's lesson. Did you guys uh, watch it? Did you have any questions about it? Should I do anything with it? Or I've got other stuff I can talk about today. Um, this week, I it's funny, I put a, a massive amount of time into this week's lesson. Uh, and it was the worst uh, viewed and uh, uh, just the the least amount of interest, <laughs> which was interesting. Like literally, it's got like 61 views. And usually by this point, uh, those videos will have like several hundred on them. Um, and that's with one of my classes having to watch it. So 20 of those views are my students watching it for homework. Um, so anyway... Um, it, if anybody is interested in that lesson, it would be kind of cool. Uh, there's an MP3 of just the rhythm section, bass and drums. Um, I'm kind of curious to hear what somebody else would do with that, um, either reproducing my parts or coming up with their, their own parts over that. So uh, if you do do that, um, let me know and uh, I'll check it out. I'm, it's, it's kind of a cool thing. Um, so let's let's talk about the triads. I think um, I had this idea as I was thinking about what else to do with this, and how he had come up with this thought that like this is all well and good, but how do we actually use this stuff? Um, how do we get it under our fingers? How do we you know how do we know what to do with it when we actually have it? Um, and I was thinking, because I don't really think about this stuff, I kind of play it, right? So I, I'm at this weird place where um, I have to rethink it all in order to, to teach it. And I was thinking, what might be kind of cool is to do this. Um, actually, let's get rid of this for the moment. So I'm going to take, um, like we started in G. All right, so here's the root. And this is going to be the one chord. So what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to harmonize the, um, the, the scale in this position using these chord voicings just in the, the E shape. So we've got the, actually, let me, let me back up a little bit. So if I was to go root to so we will have this for reference. Okay. So there's G major. All right, and uh it's in the E case root pattern. Instead of having a fancy PDF today, I kind of thought maybe I would actually write all this stuff up and then uh, post a link to it for you guys and you can just print what I've written out. <laughs> so let's say uh, the one chord in here, I'm just going to give myself a voicing on the, the Eric Johnson idea just built out of here and we're going to see what we can do. So I've got, here's the one chord, root, five, and three. Right, and then the two chord, which is A minor, root, there's the minor three for this right here, and then the five. Yeah, sorry. Then the three chord, which would be B minor, root, five, and then minor three, and then root, Five and three, this is the four chord. All right, so um, I'll go back and do that in a second. Actually, I'll do it right now. So there's G major, A minor, 
B minor, C major. All right, and then I'll come back. Uh, I start on the five chord. All right, so the five chord would be um, D major. So root, I can do a couple different ways, but in order to get the Eric Johnson voicing thing that fits in this caged root pattern, it's one way of looking at it. Um, yeah, I'll do that. All right. And then the sixth chord, which in this key would be E minor. So root five minor three the seven chord, which would be F sharp diminished. Uh, the easiest thing to do is go root um, flat five and then minor three. Whoops, actually, no, that doesn't work because that's not where those exist. Whoops. Here. So the easiest thing to do here, see, it's, it's almost like playing Tetris. <laughs> um, actually. So, because here's a diminished triad. So let's go root flat five minor three. Okay, and those chords are D major, E minor, F sharp diminished. Okay, so the idea here. is that I've got the scale All right, and this is this is just our G major in this position so root two three four five six seven root two three four five six seven root two All right but within this pattern you know we're forced to actually do this Eric Johnson thing which is basically we're spreading the voicing out so that um, you can have two strings, two notes on adjoining strings, but the third note has to be spread out, or you can have everything spread out. So there's the one chord. Um, all right, and then the A minor, here's an A minor chord. And that's the two chord. Three chord, there's the B minor, here's the C. And then we go to the next page, which I did these backwards. minor and then um, oops and then there is um, F sharp uh, diminished All right so in doing that what I've done get rid of the clone for this is I basically forced myself to learn a bunch of these chord voicings um, in ways that I, I wouldn't necessarily because it's it's a it's a, a disadvantage exercise is what my, my teacher used to call it um, the first time I was in college, you know, basically you uh, you set yourself some parameters and you have to stick with them, right? And from doing that, I was like, oh, hey, you know what? Cool, I like this A minor chord, right? And then the next part, the next thing that we can do is let's, let's find a song. So let's do In My Life by the Beatles. All right. See if this works. You guys following along? Oops, there it is. Open up. Okay. And the only reason why we're doing this is because hey, we've got a chord progression we can use. So I'm going to start at the verse, right? And typically we could play this. A major, F sharp minor, A7, D, D minor, A. There are places I remember all my life, though some have changed. We're going to just take that little part of it. Um, 
And because we're in the key of A, I'm actually going to move this whole thing up two frets. But it's still, so the A is the one chord. All right, F sharp minor is the um, the sixth chord, which I know is going to be here. And then back to A major. Or if I wanted to make that A major A7, I could just lower. Um, I could get rid of the fifth and replace it with the minor seven. We'll talk about that later on. All right, and then I've got D major. There's the four chord. And in order to make it minor, I lower the third. And I could play another A major here. I could even do another one here. All right, but the idea is that instead of trying to, um, it, you know, instead of just looking at something going, how am I going to integrate all this stuff into my playing? You know, force yourself to integrate it. You know, find a piece of music that you can, um, partially that you know, but also that is not too complicated, but still has more than three chords. And then try and harmonize it that way. Because literally, if I was doing that, so, so let's take those same chords. Um, there we are. All right, so I'm in that position. So if I come up to the D pattern, uh, A, um, got to think for a second. <laughs> um, well, F sharp minor. That's one way of doing it, I guess. And then back to A, or A7. Then I can do D here, D minor. I can do A here, or here. All right, and then if I do it up here in this position, um, A, F sharp minor, A7, or A7, D, D minor, and then back to A, maybe for this A. Um, I do that, that voicing, right? Uh, but it, it's the, the process of working your way through a, a bunch of different permutations of the same idea that gets it under your fingers. And then having to play it in time, like actually put on the recording, play along with the recording, even if you're just playing whole notes, you know. Uh, so, you know. The places I read. Oh. Oops, that, that sucks. Actually, F sharp minor. All these life and the... I like this A7. I've never played this A7 before. And then D major. Actually, so I got the D major shape here. And then if I move it up an octave, the same shape as the, the D minor in that position. Right? So just sitting here, you know, fiddling my way through this, I'm kind of coming across some chord patterns um, that I don't really, um, that really aren't in my vocabulary because I just don't play that way you know like everybody else if I'm on a gig or I'm playing music or I'm just trying to get something played I'm going to rely on the stuff that I already know um, this actually forces you out of those lanes where you, you already know this stuff and I think that's that's part of what's cool about this this has nothing to do with playing like Eric Johnson it does have a way of of getting you to know your fretboard a little bit more comprehensively it's just it's just a process all right, so I'm going to back up for a second. There was a question here from Tom. Is there a program that will convert diagrams like that to left-handed orientation? Um, um, I don't know about programs. Um, all of the, the stuff I use actually made in Adobe Illustrator myself. I kind of custom made everything just so that it was easy to, to use and it was like big enough for me because my handwriting is horrible. Most of the times when I find uh, like free chord diagrams and tablature on the internet, everything's so close together that my handwriting just doesn't doesn't work with that. So, uh, so hopefully that answers your question there, Tom. Um, I'm going to pause for a second, answer any questions. I'll be honest with you guys, I really thought I was going to have to cancel tonight. If you saw me like four hours ago, I was like curled in a little ball, like feeling like someone was stabbing my face with a screwdriver and then the medicine kicked in so one of the one of the cool things about doing this 
you know, I like you know, the fact that I can I can grab these chords like this means that if I'm playing, you know, over something that's a major scale, right? I can actually infer uh, other chords over something. So let me take um, actually. Oh, you know what? You guys were fine with. Um, Let me get a backing track going. The funniest thing is, is like, I've been, I've had this, this YouTube channel for a little over a year, actually a little under a year. Um, I'm going to put this in the comments here. This is the backing track. Oh, actually, let me, let me switch that. Um, so I was doing these in G major. I'm gonna put this in the comment in the chat box here. So that's the backtrack I'm playing over. It, it's funny because like I'll, I'll look at my YouTube channel and see like what videos are being watched, and this collection of single chord backing tracks. They're like 20, 25 minutes long of just one chord with a groove like this, and I basically designed them for my students to practice over. And then they've got like eight views each, and then got ignored. Somehow, s someone must have picked up on them because they're actually starting to get a lot of traffic, which is just kind of funny because they're just literally one chord. But they're good for practicing stuff over. So if I was to take this here, can you guys hear the, the backing? Give myself some clon. All right. So if I'm playing in G... So there's that scale, right? So you can play, most people, when you give them a scale like this in the beginning, they still like... Right? Which is what we consider really stepwise, right? It's, it's one of those things where you're, you're really... Um, it's hard to visualize where to jump to, right? So you, you generally tend to play from one note to the other, right? And when you play lines with really... Um, small distances between notes it's it's a smooth sound but it's not necessarily the most exciting thing I had, uh, actually the teacher with the disadvantage exercises concept mr. Tom Hines um, he once he once made a comment kind of offhanded but it really stuck with me and the comment was that there's drama in the wider intervals all right and it took me a minute to think about it but really this is all predictable, especially if you know a major scale. But, right, but when you hear a jump, right, any of those really wide jumps like that, right, they're a lot more rememberable than a word. Right, uh, and they're more interesting. So if you can mix it up a little bit, that's cool. The Eric Johnson thing is real angular. And I can, like, I can go up this just playing those arpeggios. One chord, two chord, three, four, five, six. Um, there's the seven chord. Oh, I just could play it there. And then, all right. Um, and if you combine, there's some stepwise. All right. And then some wider lines or intervals like that. It's, it's a lot more interesting. Now, here's the thing, is that that's one chord, literally. Well, I, the, the, the passive chord really isn't all that important. All right. But the, um, actually, I'm going to scoot up a little bit. Um, the thing is, is, I can play a chord progression that I outline all right, out of these, these arpeggios, and as long as it resolves or it ends in a place that makes sense to the listener, it's got its own inherent logic and it works, right? It all matters. On, it's like gymnastics, you know, when they do the floor exercises and they stick the landing, no matter what they do, if they stick the landing, that's like, okay, but they could be perfect. And if the ending of it doesn't make any sense and they fall down, it's garbage, right? And that's kind of how lines like this are. So what we can do, um, as I can be playing, 
it just really, oops, G major. All right, and right there I just played E minor, D, C, resolving to the G just by playing these arpeggio. because the chords, you know, basically you hear the chords being outlined, All right, it, it totally, it ends up making sense because it ends in the right place. But it's better than just playing up and down the scale like that. All right, so I do a lot of those. about them being the Eric Johnson voicings. All right, that was A minor, D7, and then into the G. All right, all of these lines that I'm playing, even with all these chromatics, A lot of those notes, they suck when you play them like this, but All right, so I can play just straight, you know. I'm totally out of that scale. I'm actually playing a D, um, um, uh, altered scale or super locri. There's a couple of names, right? But because all of that is tension that I'm resolving back to G, it's, it ends up being all good, even if I. playing total like you know white bread you know bluegrass all right and i i stick the landing on my feet by ending up in in something that's very decisively g major and it's all good all right, so I'm gonna I'm gonna pause there for a minute and see if you guys have any questions. I'm gonna check. Am I still swollen? Yeah, <laughs> I definitely am. Yeah, it's all about tension and release. Like, okay, so here's here's something really screwed up. So G major. Total happy G major, right? I can play G blues over it, and it's a minor scale. As long as I resolve it. But I can even go... Alright, I play G minor pentatonic, G sharp minor, and resolve to G major. And suddenly these sounds aren't so weird. So here's G major pentatonic. All right, and I went up to the G sharp minor, which is as outside as you're gonna get from G major. And then as long as I resolved it in the right place, it's all good. All right, you can always, Find a note that works one fret higher. All right, or if you play an idea and you're like, oh, I hit that note by accident. All right, move it up until it falls back into place. Garbage, 
as long as I know where to, to resolve it, it's actually not so bad. scale. got away with all kinds of garbage like that and uh, as long as you can stick the landing it's pretty good you can't play outside without knowing where the inside is I think that's kind of the biggest thing and then once you know where the inside is it's kind of up to you to decide do you want to go inside but when you just play random shit and call it music yeah, I don't know you know I think, you know, it's important to have all of this stuff to know where uh, the construction of each of these sounds are, but then also have ways, and we, we I talk about these organizations um, of notes, you know, this, this idea that I've got, like, I've extracted these notes that make a sound against this chord, and it, and it works, right? And they're just strategies for putting notes together that get you things that you like the sound of, right? Most of these lessons are right now they're about getting you to play basic stuff because you have to have those those foundational ideas under your fingers before you can do anything weird with it okay so let me hit a couple of things so jeremy says uh extending the tension is interesting it evokes a new feel absolutely that's what we're doing we're looking for for colors like that um, I got Oscar here. Actually, how does this work? You know what? I've got. Could you see? There you go. Arpeggios from the G major chord scale resolving to the G sounds slick. Yeah, and that's kind of what we've been doing. <laughs> Even like, um, actually, I stole this from Tom Harkenrider, but like a lot of the West Coast blues guys, um, they'll play the minor four chord. Right? And you just have that chromatic line that moves down. Right? Everyone's got a different way of looking at that, but you have those, those movements. So you've got things that are diatonic, which means. They actually exist within the key and you've got things that are non-diatonic even if i'm going all right um one of my students in, in class wanted to um, play this tune called ladybird jazz tune it's got this they call it the ladybird turnaround And it's cool. It's just a bunch of chords that eventually end up in the in the right place. So you could be inside the key, you could be outside the key. You just have to decide where where you want to be and really how much dissonance you want. You know, because the the reality is that you can't do this all the time. Uh, if you're if you're really going for it and you're in a situation where you need the energy and you want that texture, that's cool. Um, if you're playing over a Van Morrison on a on a pop gig, however, 
a lot of this stuff isn't going to work too well. I, I love stories of um, Scott Henderson talking about getting fired from wedding band gigs because he would try and, and practice uh, giant steps over uh, Madonna songs like a virgin. You know, he would just superimpose this stuff. And in his mind, in his ears, it was working, but like to the 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 people who was their special day, it wasn't really that working. It wasn't really what they were paying for. All right. Um, you guys have any questions? I actually wasn't going to spend that much time on this, but I, I thought this would be kind of fun. The other thing to remember is that uh, these chords, you know, I did in the one, the first triad lesson, Eric Johnson triad lesson, all of the triads are, are major. And then I had somebody ask me, hey, you know, are you going to do a lesson on minor chords? And I was like, no. <laughs> um, and then I thought about it and I was like, well, wait a second. I, I, you know, maybe folks need to be reminded that if you know what these chord tones are, like root five and three, all right, then you should know that the difference in a major and a minor chord is you lower the third, all right? So this guy goes down a half step. Now it's minor. If you need it diminished, you lower the third and the fifth. If you want it augmented, you raise the fifth and play a major third. It ends up being one of those things that once you get a little bit of that knowledge, you want to be able to take any of this stuff uh, and uh, and adjust it for whatever your needs are. And sometimes I take it for granted that people are going to do that. So if there's something in a lesson and you go, hey, this may seem really obvious to you, but it's really not obvious to me. Um, I don't understand this. Let me know. Like put a, a question in the comments or shoot me a, a direct message or whatever. And I'll, I'll address it here. That's part of the reason why we're doing this. Okay, I'm going to pause and let you guys ask questions. Also, the dogs are barking. It's J-Rocket night. I've got my, uh, my dude and then I'm, I've got my archer now, finally. things that I've been working on myself is this idea that um, my time is never good enough like I always feel like um, yeah I play in decent time I mean I've been playing music for a long time and I've spent most of my life practicing with a metronome um, but on, on my own it's it's kind of a it's a little bit of a struggle sometimes so I kind of want to talk about like how can we practice with a metronome in a way that that um, makes sense that's going to help you in the in the in the short term as well as the long term um so maybe let's bring a metronome up here on the old ipad whoops where's my metronome i've actually if you knew the amount of time i spent torturing my wife with the metronome going on in this house you would probably buy her a bottle of irish whiskey for Christmas to make up for it. I'm not even kidding. Where's my metronome? Oh. Okay. <laughs> Oscar is 100% correct. Or Osnoy. Okay, so here is my metronome here. Um, we're going to add that. Okay, so let's set the metronome. So um, say I set this to 100 here. And if you don't have a metronome or a metronome app and you're not practicing with it on a regular basis, I have words for you. Is that too loud? That is probably fairly loud. You, can you guys hear that decently? All right, so typically someone put a metronome on and just one. All right, and then we practice with it like this, which is all well and good. You know, you got to be able to play in time with basically what is quarter notes. And most of the time when I'm practicing with a metronome, I'm not really thinking about this as being 
triplets or eighth notes or any of those kinds. Of, I'm basically thinking, okay, there's the click, and I'm doing twos against the click, or threes, or four, or let's see if I can do five. All right, whatever. It's like stuff was very sloppy with that. All right. So the next thing that happens is I'll say, hey, you know, I'm playing at 100. Let's put the metronome so that it's at half the tempo, but we're going to count it as beats two and four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Now this is a little harder at first, because what happens, three, four, one, two, basically making sure that you can start in the right place, you're starting on beat one, but then also that you're actually able to feel the missing clicks, right? If you're able to do that, that means that your, your internal, your body clock is actually pretty strong. It took me a long time to be able to do even just this, one, two, three, even like, uh, <laughs> play anything like that and if you think about it it's really just the backbeat you know one two three and my first inclination when doing this is I usually find myself rushing a little bit So if you can play music with, with this, this is a pretty good first step. All right. I'm going to, let's pause this for a second. So we bring up Osnoy. Does Steve Ray Vaughan and Monk at the same time? And Tom asks Osnoy. Osnoy is one of my favorite guitar players. He's an Israeli guy, lives in New York. He plays this really crazy, like, Seriously, it's like Steve Ray Vaughan and, and Thelodious Monk at the same time. I'm going to put um, something here for you too. Okay, whole tone blues. If you want to hear, um, let me do this in a way where I don't actually. Um, so here's a link. I don't want to play it through here because I'll get a. So if you get a chance, to listen to that. Um, that's blues of the whole tone scale. Um, so, good metronome app. You know, almost every metronome app is pretty good. This is called Pro Metronome, the one I've got here. And the only reason why I'm really using it here is because it's it's on my iPad, and I was it's it's easy with the, the big iPad to use it in classes, and everybody can see it. Um, there's actually I don't know if I can show you this. There's this thing I, I just got because this computer is brand new. It's called Tunable. And it's got a metronome and a tuner, and I really like it. Um, let me show you. We're going to cheat here for a second. It's, it's this thing here. Actually, maybe I can just share my screen. You guys see how this thing works. It's pretty slick. Okay, so there's... This is called tunable, right? So this is on the tuner. And it, and I like using this with my wind instrument students at the school because they can hear... Um, and watch their pitch. All right. So this is it's cool for this. I'm seeing you're messing this up because I don't think it's processing right. But it's also got a metronome in here that's also handy. So I like this um, because it's got a couple things in here. I'm gonna tune using my tuner because I don't think the computer likes. Sorry guys, I was just really messed up. So one of the things I like about the, the tunable metronome, 
but you, you can and all of them have this so I've got the tempo here um, how many beats per bar what the subdivisions are so I, I had this like the next step here um, I was just having on beat two two three four one two four one two three four one <laughs> Basically, being able to keep that going for even just playing scales. One, two, three. So I'm rushing a little bit. So this has been kind of my my self torture for the last couple of days. triplets I'm screwing that up All right. um, I, I like I like that app a lot um, oops get rid of that got all my camera stuff mixed up here um, so that one now when they've got it for the reason why I know about this is because um, I saw one of my uh, uh, students, big band students, last year using it, and I was like, "That's kind of cool tuner." And I, I had to get a new uh, tuner for this computer and realize that I might as well give it a try. So I, I like it. I, I like usually the tuner works really slick. I, I think it's not like in the the computer running all these things at once. Um, and then it's got the metro in it. So there's that one. Um, the one I've used forever on my phone. Which ends up being the one I end up using a lot is called Metro Timer, um, and it looks like this. Um, typically, if you hear me using a metronome, it's usually that one. So that one's called Metro Timer. Um, I've got Pro Metronome on my iPad, and I've got this thing called Tunable, um, and, and it's it's worth it to spend a few dollars. Don't ever buy a free metronome or a free music app uh, off of your app store or, or phone app whatever um a couple things one of them is just that you want the people to get paid for it but then the other thing is that um you're either dealing with really bad poorly coded uh apps or you're dealing with the fact that you've got advertisements all the time which you know it's kind of a pain in the butt so um so some of most of us know who, who oscar is uh oscar writes for uh, vintage guitar magazine and premier guitar and a bunch of other uh, things like that um, new record I have not heard so check out Osnoy check out his newest thing and then Oscar if you've got a link um, to your current interview or article go ahead and post it there in the comments all right take a pause here and see if you guys have any questions the metronome thing you know, it's, you always say, you know, are you practicing with a metronome? People are like, well, I guess, I don't know, it's on when I'm playing. But you want to be strategic with how you use it. And I think that's part of the, um, part of the thing is, is, is I want to give you guys some strategies because it's hard. And honestly, for me, it's one of the things that I suck at the most is um, having this time that that is rock solid. There's a great Victor Wooten video on YouTube where he's literally... Um, someone gives them a tempo and it's silence and uh, you know after like a minute he can come in like 70 bars like on the downbeat but he's got such a such a great internal clock and I'll never be Victor Wooten but I've always thought about that and realizing that uh, um, uh, that it's, it's just it's important your time has to be internal I get students all the time, well, I just follow the drummer. And it's like, well, no, because if you're following, then you're reacting, which means that you're not playing music at the same time, which means that you're late. So, okay. Uh, let me open it up to questions in terms of any of the lessons or in general. Um, also, um, my conservatory semester ends after next week, and... Um, which means that I can kind of do whatever I want in terms of driving lesson content. I'm going to be doing a bunch of beginner lessons, uh, which probably for most of you guys is not going to be very interesting, but I kind of want to get them in there before people buy their 
brand new Squire Stratocasters for Christmas for their kids. <laughs> um, so there'll be a bunch of that kind of stuff on the channel. Um, but also, if there's stuff that you guys are like specifically interested in, let me know, and I'll, I'll do that. I kind of want to do some like, here's some Hendrix stuff I like, or here's a cool Osnoy lick, or, or whatever. You know, I, I kind of want to explore some other players' uh, vibes, and part of that is because I'm in doing this, I'm I'm able to practice things I want to, and not feel guilty about not spending time working on this stuff. <laughs> it's, it's it, you know, so some of it's selfish, but. You guys like uh, country guitar with all the... Okay, so Oscar says, How do you get a student to feel a groove in their bodies? I have a student who cancels off the metronome when he plays. You mean he plays so good that you can't hear the metronome anymore? Because that's, that's a thing. That's like when you know you're in time. It's like when the metronome just disappears or the click disappears. Um, you know, part of it is, is like when I teach rhythm guitar, the idea that you're always feeling whatever that basic beat is, the, the quarter note or, or whatever, you know, the bottom part of the time signature is, um, you have to have that in your body, right? So if I've got two, three, one. Two, even that's two and four I'm feeling all the quarter notes right and then whatever the subdivision has to be here all right so you're basically you have to have the time happening in two places there's the the bigger part of it which is just the beat and there's the subdivisions of the beat all right even when I'm like If I turn off the metronome and play the same thing, one, two, three. All right, that was horrible, right? But you could feel the time, right? You, you knew where the time was. Even if I was playing something that wasn't continuous like that, like one, two, three. You have to play the space you have to play everything notes and spaces you have to have that physically in your body and you know the ways that I, I get that into people first thing is like you know if you've ever studied with me um, I'll take something like out of my foundations for a guitar book um, so this is gonna be a flyer let me see if the, I have it on here um, Oh, look at that. It's actually in existence here. All right. So the, first, the beginning part of getting anyone to play time is defining what time is to start with. Right? But then we start with this. We don't even play guitar. You know, we put the metronome on 60. You guys can hear that, I assume. All right. And I make sure that they can actually feel it off the instrument. So they're tapping their foot. One, two, and that first line is straight quarter notes. So one, two, three, four, one, two. And they gotta be able to keep it in time and, and in the right place. One, two, three. The next line, those are half notes. The thing to remember is that you know you still have to feel the time through the longer notes. So we've got the metronome going, feeling the chord note. One, two. 
three. You can't see I'm tapping my foot. <laughs> one, two, three. But counting out loud. One, two, three. You'll notice that I really make sure that people have to verbalize what they're doing. Three, four. You have to define it. Next line. Two, three, four, one, two, and so on. And then when you get to the next couple lines of this, one, two, three, you have to mix and match these things. One, two, three, four. If someone's doing really good with this stuff in the beginning, I'll get them used to the idea that they should subdivide. So thinking, uh, counting eighth notes while you're playing all these rhythms. One and two and three and four and one and two and three and four. Getting used to that uh, it, it's a really good thing, right? And if you think about it, it's just your foot going down, up, down, up, down, up. Now, once they're able to do that, and that doesn't happen very often, in the beginning, you know, I've got them basically playing chords. I can't believe I'm just like showing you guys the book on <laughs> here. But so if you look at these things, these first chords, you've got the chords and then you've got uh, these lines where it's literally just quarter notes. And getting them to synchronize um, the, the chord movement so that they're in time. And what this goes back to, Oscar, is the idea that we have to build this from the ground up for a lot of people, right? Because there's so much synchronization. Three, and making sure that you get from the A to the D back to the A without stopping. It all has to happen in time. And we're just doing down strums. All right. Just doing that is hard for someone in, in the very beginning. And sometimes it's hard for people who've been playing for a long time. All right. So the next thing is we talk about eighth notes. And eighth notes in this time signature, it's a half of a beat. So we're thinking one and two. And making sure that they know that eighth notes are about dividing the time in half. Let me do something. Gonna work. Doesn't mean anything. All right. So, you know, when they tap their foot, they still have to tap in the same place, down on the downbeat. So thinking one and two and or down up, down up. Um, wish you could see my foot tapping. All right. But you have to have this feeling of like both the front and the back half of the beat. Three and four. And then we clap it. Um, Actually, I should have tried to walk this in here. So they're going one and this is example number one. One and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and one and two and. Three. Right. Um, when you get down to like number five, one and two and three and four and still feeling the time to the parts that you're not playing is real important. One and two and three and four and I'll um, I'll get your comment in just a second, Oscar. But the idea here is that you're building this internal clock, and then when you apply it to the guitar, we we'll start talking about strumming eighth notes. What's happening is you're not really thinking about having to. Um, um, you know, basically, you're building this so that it's involuntary. You don't have to think about it. So eighth notes are always there. One. And... So you think about it. If you guys have been playing for a while, you're not really worrying too much about um, about the time you're feeling it because you know how to find where the time is. You know how to play in the pocket, whatever that subdivision is supposed to be. All right. In the beginning, though, we try and build this stuff up this way. All right. So even when they're playing. Something that's got a, a tide rhythm in it. They still have this physical feeling of where the time is at all times. If they have to think about the time while they're trying to do something hard, they're never going to play in time. All right? And this is kind of the, the thing with, with Oscar's comment here. Is that if he forgets that he's supposed to be playing with the groove, if, if the groove doesn't exist within him already 
then he kind of has to break it all back down and and define what playing in the pocket is working on the mechanics of of strumming you know 16th notes or, or or playing 16th notes in time and then come back to the music because the idea really when you're really playing you're not counting anything you know you, you really aren't or you rarely are you know you're, you're really kind of uh you should remember how it feels to play these rhythms correctly but in order to do that you have to define it and you have to have this muscle memory of how it works when it's correct and I think that's that's kind of like with my students where they're in that position, um, either they quit pretty quickly or they stick with me forever. If they've got the patience for me to like tear it all down, deconstruct their playing, and then get them starting back up again, doing it correctly, they're in a much better place and they play much better. And, you know, and they, they understand it. Um, if they don't want to do it, it, you know, and I'm fine with that, you know. Um, it's not the the kind of lessons for everybody, but I think that's the answer to that guy's question is is that uh, you know you need to bring him back to the beginning. Even like something like you know the Ross Bolton funk guitar book, you know, getting them to execute that. So let me um, let me put a link to this up in the right place. This is, I have probably, I bought this in 2002. I've probably sold more of these books. Ross passed away a few years ago, so I've, I've probably made his estate a bunch of money. It's the one book I wish I had uh, written myself. Um, hey, if I put this on the screen, are you guys able to click on that link and have it go anywhere? It's kind of a dumb question, but I'm just kind of curious how these things work. All right. Um, and I'm, I'm kind of half tempted to do a, a lesson series based off of the, that book. It's someone else's book, um, but it's, it's a really good method for getting people to play just basic mechanics, 16th note mechanics. Um, because there's all kind of, it's not just the right hand strumming, it's also how the left hand controls uh, muting strings and, and slides and chord voicings are all a little difficult for a lot of people. Um, you know, if you can get through that book, you're in pretty good shape for playing rhythm guitar. And then that other stuff, like you can apply it to um, to uh, your lead guitar playing too. I mean, you really can't play. Ooh, that is really swollen. Look at that. I'm like a chipmunk. Not swollen, swollen. <laughs> um, it's just, it's a great method. I really love that method. And I think everybody should work through it at some point. So. All right, I'm going to pause for a second. You guys have any other questions? Oscar's got like all the good questions tonight. Everyone's got good questions, but Oscar's got some of my favorite stuff. Oh, the one in the chat works, but not on the screen. Cool. Okay. Well, it's here. So we got Oscar, Dave, Tom, you're still here. It's funny, it says I've just got like five people on right now. How are you? Are you still here, Jeremy? Well, actually, I missed this one from Jeremy. You do more things live than most do in post. I'm not entirely certain I understand what that means, but I'm going to take it as a compliment. <laughs> Cool. Hey, Oscar, have you played any gigs since we've been in uh, lockdown? Well, you're in Los Angeles, so like, there's no restaurants open or anything now. I'm actually, uh, I, I turned down another Christmas gig. Kind of sucks. I think I've, I've canceled or turned down about 60 shows since March, and it's really bumming me out. So... Cool. All right. Well, if that is it, I'm going to let you guys roll. It's actually uh, over an hour. Um, I had fun.
I, I didn't really cover this week's video lesson because I don't think anybody watched this week's video lesson. If you guys do have questions about it, um, let me know, ask them. Remember that I do this on Saturdays as well, Saturday mornings, 8.30 to 9.30 a.m. Um, or sometimes it goes longer. Um, and that one's a little less organized. It's more about whatever you guys want to talk about or if I've got other stuff. It's not necessarily always a lesson. But if you got questions, feel free to come to that one. Um, if you guys got questions uh, of any kind here. Um, I'm also going to start a pedal board rebuild here pretty soon. Um, pedal Star Galactica. Um, I've got some... Oops. Um, This guy's gonna get torn apart and I'm gonna put like a deck on the pedal board and move things around. I got the, the Archer is new and there's a JHS uh, splitter right there to kind of sort out some of the problems I was having going to the Iridium. Hey, um, also the guitar sound. I, I made the realization that I think you guys are getting partial Iridium. Yeah, the, 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 some of that's the Iridium. And some of that is the, the microphone, microphone. Like if I was to turn off the microphone, actually, can I mute this? No, I can. actually just the iridium by itself and then um if i can i'll shut off the iridium here this is just the microphone i forgot that both were going through my uh my what you guys think of, of the differences there I, I kind of I don't know I, I, I don't know if there's gonna be like a phase issue or not with the um, the iridium like that I'll show I've been filming tunes by vocalist coach um, I've, I've seen some of that on YouTube actually and yes ancient aliens did build my pedal board 10,000 years ago and it's really dirty and dusty, and uh, there's a curse, kind of like Tutankhamun's tomb. If you uh, if you turn it on and you're not me, um, weird things happen. So, all right, gentlemen, I'm going to split. I think there are chicken hot wings. My mic level is really low. Okay, um, actually, how about now? That's the. That's that mic level. The other thing I can do. Um, so this is just my old webcam level. That's the, the little portable one I've been carrying around. And then this micro, this computer has what they call studio microphone. It's got like three different microphones somewhere in it. So it's, it's a little bit better than this, the, uh, the old uh, iMac. Um, I don't know what that sounds like either. So what you're hearing right now is just the computer's onboard microphone. And then this is my fancy microphone. Um, and I, I would almost think that by the time it gets streamed, they all sound the same. <laughs> I just like having the the, um, the uh, share microphone, the big one actually, uh, I think handles the guitar a little bit better. So. Oh, it says new comments. Hang on a second. Oh. Okay. So all the levels are cool. All right, gentlemen. I'm going to split. Thank you very much for hanging out. Always fun talking about this stuff. And like I said, sometimes I feel like you guys don't ask questions because you're afraid of, of uh, interfering. And the reality is, is that I live for the questions. It makes my life a lot easier. So in the future, go ahead and ask. <laughs> all right, guys. Have a good night.